and thanks to everybody listening. You're all very welcome to the launch of Race in American Literature, edited by Professor John Ernest. He's a Judge Hugh M. Morris a Professor of American Literature at the University of Delaware. It's the, one of the first books in a new series called Themes in American Literature and Culture. And it's actually one of three books that John is writing for CUP. Alongside this, there's the Cambridge Introduction to Race in American Literature and the Cambridge Companion to Race in American Literature. And with Professor Stephanie Lye from, <coughs> from the University of Wisconsin, he's editor of a new electronic initiative called Elements on Race in American Literature, which we're all very excited about. <clears throat> in all of these, John brings a lifetime of learning and knowledge to bear. Everything he does for CUP is distinguished by an intellectual seriousness, by sensitivity, and most of all, by an outstanding intellectual authority. Here, his excellent proposal for this book set itself these goals. <clears throat> the story of the presence of race in American literature is not a simple story, but a decidedly messy one. And much of the story has to do with how the different literary traditions work with and against one another. The volume will explore the unsteady foundations of American literary history, examining, examining the hard, hardening racial fault line throughout the 19th and the 20th century, and then consider various aspects of the multiple literary traditions that emerge from this fractured cultural landscape. It's a theme that many of you will be living through as teachers, as students, and as citizens. We're absolutely delighted to have such a distinguished team uh, of contributors writing uh, on it for us. And my main reason for making this introduction today was to thank all of them, and especially John for, for making the book happen. CUP is proud to have the book on our list. I'll hand over now to you, John. Uh, thank you, Ray, and welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, um, attending today. We we're very happy to have you. And I'm both pleased and honored to welcome you to this launching event for Race in American Literature and Culture. I believe that the promotional notices for the event presented me as the author of this book, but in fact, I wrote very little of it. And the writing I did for it is the least significant work in the volume. What is distinctive about this volume is that it brings together a truly impressive group of international scholars representing a number of different but related literary and cultural traditions, African-American, Asian-American, Latinx, and Native American, among others. When I first considered the challenge of assembling a collection of essays on race in American literature and culture, I thought it was an impossible task as there is no single story to tell here and certainly no neat chronology to follow. A history so often guided by white supremacist ideology has produced various literary traditions, each one, represent, resp each one responding to specific forms of repression and control, each one focused on building communities and creating a literary tradition that can speak to and support the narrative and discursive strategies central to the survival and growth of those communities. Accordingly, I tried to assemble a volume that took the impossibility of telling a neat story about the history of race in the United States as its mission statement, bringing together different traditions and methodologies in what I hoped would be a reasonably coherent and purposeful volume one that might encourage cross-disciplinary and cross-cultural work in the future. The volume is, is divided into seven sections, each an attempt to bring different fields together in ways that can get at the larger story of race in American literature and culture. The essay is gathered in the early sections of the volume, Fractured Foundations, Racial Citizenship, Contending Forces and Reconfigurations, focus on the cultural construction of race. In many ways, the essays in these early sections focus on what Charles Mills has called the cognitive and moral economy of race, both as American racial culture shaped writings by white American writers and as it shaped the priorities of writers from the communities defined by and against those dynamics. The essays gathered in the three sections that follow, rereading race, case studies, and reflections and prospects, focus primarily on the cultural communities and literary traditions that have emerged from this history, exploring the representational priorities and the interpretive methods central to those traditions. All of this is to say though, what I said to, at the start, that the writing I did for the volume is not terribly important. The success of this volume depended on the truly incredible scholars who agreed to write for this volume. Accordingly, I'd like to turn this over to our experts, both today's panel and our other contributors to the volume who have joined us today. 
I'll introduce all of the panelists now, and I ask you to hold your questions and comments until the end or offer them through the Q&A feature. For now, it's my honor to introduce scholars who have had a great influence on my own thinking about race in American literature and culture. Maria Julia Fabi is Associate Professor of American Literature at the University of Ferrara in Italy. She is the author of Passing and the Rise of the African-American Novel, which I think is the best study of the subject available. And she is the editor of the Penguin Classics edition of William Wells Brown's Clotel. She has also been instrumental in recovering and studying the work of Sutton E. Griggs. And she is currently working on, a, on the critical edition of Sutton E. Griggs, Pointing the Way, as well as a manuscript on African-American speculative fiction during the Harlem Renaissance. Gisa Mackenthon teaches American studies at Rostock University in Germany. Her books include Metaphors of Dispossession, American Beginnings and the Translation of Empire, Fictions of the Black Atlantic, and the co-edited volumes, Decolonizing Prehistory, Deep Time and Indigenous Knowledges in North America, and Sea Changes, Historicizing the Ocean. She continues this astoundingly wide and deep range in her current research, which focuses on the transatlantic history of enclosures, evictions, and ecocide. Derek Spires is Associate Professor of Literatures in English and Affiliate Faculty in American Studies, Visual Studies, and Media Studies at Cornell University. He specializes in early African American and American print culture, citizenship studies, and African American intellectual history. He is the author of The Practice of Citizenship, Black Politics and Print Culture in the Early United States, which has quickly become one of the most influential studies in, our, in the field. Kara Vigil is Associate Professor of American Studies at Amherst College and a council member for the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. She was the Jan Kahn uh, Fellow and Lecturer in American Studies for Trinity College in 2020 and she is the author of Indigenous Intellectuals, Sovereignty, Citizenship, and the American Imagination, a book I very much recommend. Edley Wong is Professor of English at the University of Maryland at College Park, and she is the author of Racial Reconstruction, Black Inclusion, Chinese Exclusion, and the Fictions of Citizenship, and also Neither F Fugitive Nor Free, Atlantic Slavery, Freedom Suits, and the legal culture of travel. In her ability to cross disciplinary boundaries and to speak with deep expertise of different cultural and literary traditions, Edley's embody, Edley embodies the perspective that this volume is designed to promote. I couldn't be more pleased to have this panel representing the volume, and I wish I had time to introduce all of the other contributors because it's really um, an impressive and inspiring group. Um, but at this point, I'll turn it over to Julia. Thank you, John. I'm very, very happy to be here. And I would like to thank you publicly for um, asking me to contribute to this very important volume. I'm very happy to be part of this project and to be here today as well. My chapter, um, I will just make a few brief comments, but I will be ready to answer any questions in the Q&A um, period at the end. So my chapter for this volume focuses um, again on passing. Um, passing as both a theme and a literary strategy. Um, I have chosen to organize um, the chapter uh, chronologically, uh, starting from the 19th century and ending it in, um, in the 21st century. And I focus mostly on um, African-American um, fiction, on African-American contributions to uh, the theme of passing, because I think they're really um, particularly um, useful and insightful in terms of uh, questioning what seems to be what is often treated as a very um, sensationalistic topic uh, that seems to be self-explanatory. Here we have almost a magic um, change from black to white, or in some cases from white to black, and uh, um, many and often, uh, I mean of uh, 
and often we do not question these uh, um, these categories, which on, on the contrary are um, are to be questioned, and that's what African American uh, writers do in their novels of Pessin. So. Um, Pessin is um, a theme that continues to attract attention and continues to attract a lot of, uh, um, continues to intrigue both readers and writers even, uh, even today. And my reason for focusing on the tradition, for giving a sense of the tradition, was that I was uh, hoping, the, the, and, I, and I hope it will work this way, I was hoping to um, make readers um, more self-aware in terms of approaching what is often a theme that, as I was saying, um, is treated rather sensationalistic, sensationalistically. So um, making readers more aware uh, means to uh, provide tools, for instance, to read more critically uh, these texts, also in terms and also in terms of their um, of the literary strategies that are um, deployed in these novels, the very experimental literary strategies that are often deploy deployed in these novels, and also to um, give tools to appreciate um, the intertextual dialogues that characterize also contemporary um, novels um, on, on passing. And these are both um, aspects that I think give a depth to the um, to the topic and to the literary tradition connected with this topic that I think is very much needed also today. When I talk about this um, topic, I'm often asked, is this novel based on a real event? And uh, that is always a, a tricky question because uh, um, even if it is, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been re-elaborated um, in literary ways, in, as I was saying, in very experimental literary ways often. And um, it, also, it also means that uh, this, uh, what we consider, what was started as a real event, at the same time was uh, influenced in terms of its, uh, um, of its uh, literary representation by a tradition of literary representation that we often do not know and that I think is important to, uh, for us to know in order to appreciate also what contemporary writers are, are doing. Um, so, um, novels of uh, passing, very quickly, uh, I would just uh, mention that they um, explore um, the meaning of uh, self supposedly uh, self-explanatory categories like blackness and whiteness. And uh, um, as they explore these categories, what they do is to um, bring to light, to emphasize, to make us aware of what is behind these um, categories. Um, and they bring to light intersecting issues, um, very complex and very different intersecting issues, like class, obviously, but also geography, citizenship, mobility, access to education, uh, the issue of genealogy, the relationship between um, the individual and uh, one's family history and family relations, issues of gender identity, and um, very importantly, also issues of language. And this is an exploration and a complication, a way of um, um, complicating uh, this uh, issue of passion and this issue of identity more broadly in ways that uh, in ways that bring to, um, to light again, also, um, as I was saying before, the kind of literary experimentation that, um, that is necessary in order to, um, to explore these, uh, um, these categories of blackness and whiteness. And I will give just a few examples of, this, um, of the kinds of literary experimentation that we, um, that we have in these novels and that I mentioned in the essay. Um, we could start from um, the 19th century with uh, um, William Wells Brown, with uh, Frank Webb, with, uh, um, for, with um, Francis Harper, and the way in which they um, presented and introduced um, a new protagonist in American fiction, meaning uh, the African American community. And they did it um, exactly by exploiting uh, passing as a literary strategy, not only as, as a theme. Um, we could also think about um, the use of satire in these uh, in these novels, and I'm thinking, for instance, of the um, of Pauline Hopkins's um, satire of uh, patriarchal definitions of womanhood, or of uh, uh, Schuyler's um, very satirical um, 
uh, expose of the um, capitalistic exploitation of racial prejudice. Or we could also think about the radical use of uh, a central consciousness in Nella Larsen's passing. And I will never emphasize enough also because she's one of my favorite uh, writers, how important this, um, this use of a central consciousness is in understanding her novel, which is something that we could discuss if we ever have time to talk about um, also the uh, Netflix adaptation of, uh, uh, of Passing. So uh, to conclude, um, this uh, uh, literary experimentation brings us um, or takes us beyond the sensationalism of this uh, theme into a much more rich, uh, into a much richer territory of, um, of analysis and cultural and political intervention. And this, I think, is the real contribution that the theme of passing continues to have today. Thank you. Shall I continue? Okay, I'm next. Hello, I'm Gesa Mackenton. I'm speaking from Rostock, although it, uh, my background, of course, is somewhere else. It's uh, Mesa Verde. Um, yeah, I also contributed to this volume, uh, an essay which belongs to the group entitled Fractured Foundations. It's one of the earliest essays in the volume. Um, I would very much also like to, to thank uh, John Ernest for putting this together. Uh, something that is very particular about this novel or that is uh, conspicuous for, for this uh, for this volume is that it uh, combines essays on all different kinds of uh, racial constructions. So all the constructions of race that are thinkable basically in, in the nation, United States of America are being addressed both in a historical manner, but also in more contemporary ways. So this is something that um, I would say is something that uh, typifies this novel that makes a special, a special uh, not a novel, <laughs> a volume, a history book. And I would also very much like to, um, to thank uh, John and also Cambridge University Press for including non-American scholars into this, because um, I think Julia would agree with me when I'm saying that uh, being writing from outside of America gives you a, a kind of different perspective on what's going on in America, how America was constructed, is being constructed. Um, and so on. So you simply, uh, at least I can speak for myself, this um, writing from Germany or from Europe um, gives you a, a very particular um, perspective. Um, the essay I wrote about, it's uh, called Protean Oceans, Racial Uncertainty and Arthur Gordon Pym and um, Emmanuel Apedaka. Uh, Protean Oceans, so it's, it's two oceanic novels, it's two novels with a maritime setting. I chose the title Protean uh, after the, the Greek god uh, Proteus, who is a shapeshifter. And what I'm trying to refer to by, by using this, uh, this or making this mythical reference um, is this topic of racial uncertainty. I must confess that when John asked me to contribute an essay to a volume on race, I wasn't so sure whether I would be the right person to do this because I didn't really write about race before. Um, I have a book on the discourse, the yeah, Renaissance early modern discourse of dispossession, so territorial dispossession. So that's pretty much on land grabbing in the early modern period. Then I had a book on uh, the transatlantic slave, um, uh, uh, slave uh, trade, um, which is basically, which contains chapters uh, where I also talk about these two novels. But my more recent research is about constructions of deep time. So I'm returning, in a way, I'm returning to the topic of um, the justification of territorial dispossession by forcing indigenous peoples into giving evidence of continuous inhabitants of uh, places in America and so on. So the construction of deep time and early settlement, early immigrations, pre-Columbian immigrations to America, um, and, and, the, and the kind of legal settings within which these, uh, these discourses are often um, un uh, unfolded. Um, and all of this, uh, the occupation with time, especially in the 19th century, you know, with the discovery, uh, yeah, the discovery of geological time and Darwin's discoveries and so on, um, can be shown to be accompanied by a strong sense of uncertainty. So yeah, the uncertainty about the length of time that people in general have been inhabiting America, but especially colonial 
settlers have been inhabiting America. Um, the uncertainty is stretching way beyond the 5,000 years that had been the uh, more or less the, the Christian consensus until then. Um, and the uncertainty being related with the extreme, almost uncanny Gothic age, you know, uh, which uh, for which uh, all those indigenous people had been inhabiting the colonized spaces or spaces to be colonized. <coughs> and this is pretty much um, this is pretty much a topic, uh, especially in one of the novels I'm discussing in my essay, and that's Arthur Gordon Pym, which is a maritime novel. It's an exception to the rule of most of the stories of Edgar Allan Poe that most uh, listeners or readers probably know. You, most of you will associate Poe with, with the um, tales of terror uh, and so on, you know, follow the house of Usher. Uh, this is his only completed novel. It has a maritime setting. It's about a group of explorers uh, who don't really have a significant aim or a specific aim, They're traveling up and down the ocean until they arrive in Antarctica, <clears throat> where they discover unexpectedly uh, an island which is inhabited by altogether black people whose teeth are even black. So there's a strong uh, exaggeration of uh, color coding in this novel. So they are extremely black, they are altogether black, they are af uh, afraid of everything that is white. So Poe uh, is not altogether serious in this novel. He is both serious and not serious. He is playing, he's making fun in a way on the racial color coding that was going on in the scientific racism of the time, of course, in the mid 19th century, starting in the 1820s or becoming stronger in the 1820s and 30s. Um, but he is also uh, apparently expressing a serious nervousness about age, because uh, as it turns out, the uh, discoverers are the only two survivors of the hostile attack from the natives, from the defensive natives. They discover ancient ruins with ancient inscriptions, or maybe, or maybe not. So all of this is again uncertain, protean, as I'm saying. Uh, maybe it's natural, maybe it's man-made, there's a discussion about this. In the end, I think uh, the, the editor who is Edgar Allan Poe himself decides these inscriptions and evidence are, is actually um, man-made and not natural. So the novel expresses among many, many other things um, uh, besides its caricature of, of race uh, discourse, and race science, it also expresses an extreme uncertainty or even anxiety, you can say, or fear about um, antiquity, about uh, ancient uh, evidence of ancient inhabitation by the natives inhabiting the land which those uh, white uh, colonizers or visitors are trying to, to colonize. So this is, um, this is what uh, fascinated me since I first stumbled across Arthur Gordon Pym, and this is also, I mean, it's basically Arthur Gordon Pym and my desire to write anew about it, which convinced me to, to respond positively to John's invitation. I thought, okay, there's enough race <laughs> in this uh, novel. Um, and, uh, and there are nice ways to combine the topic of race, the way it's being negotiated in Arthur Gordon Pym um, with my other topics, the topic of dispossession and the topic of antiquity, construction of antiquity. So what I'm doing in this piece, I'm comparing Arthur Gordon's Pym, very well, uh, um, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, very well-known, much discussed novel uh, with a rather less known novel by a Trinidadian author who uh, published uh, his novel Emmanuel Apodoca in, um, in 1852, I think, or 1853. So shortly after Moby Dick, and uh, one of my hunches is that he knew of Moby Dick, when he wrote Emmanuel Apodoca, that's a novel, it's a romance novel about uh, uh, yeah, a pirate, but he's also a rebel, of course, a social rebel uh, who lives on the sea in a highly technologized pirate ship, uh, which is superior, technologically superior, and also intellectually superior to all the British and all the other ships which are chasing it. And he has a somewhat uh, uncertain racial background. And part of the novel is being spent in discussing both his racial background and the consequences of, uh, of this uh, socially undecided birth. Um, and it's, it's basically a novel of revenge. Uh, he, he, he carries out a vendetta against uh, particularly a man, but also the British nation for, um, uh, yeah, for, for uh, abusing uh, yeah, most, mostly for abusing African-American women or slave women 
in America. So it's it's both a private vendetta, but it's also in a much more collective and symbolic uh, revenge that he carries out. So what's central in these uh, in both novels uh, is this um, this item uh, evidence of knowledge, evidence of antiquity in non-white races or peoples belonging to non-white races. So in the case of Emmanuel Epidoka, it is the inheritance of Egyptian knowledge, for example, Egypt being that country of antiquity from which most Mediterranean Christian nations or, or the pre-Christian nations like Rome and Greece actually inherited uh, so much of the most important knowledge in the fields of astronomy and mathematics and geometry and so on. And there was a big debate uh, in the 19th century about uh, the color or the race of the ancient Egyptians. So this is what um, uh, what Emmanuel Apadoka, that novel, um, refers to. And it's also a discussion to which um, Pym makes reference. So this fear of antiquity, the fear that the, col the colonized other has knowledge that is superior and much more ancient than the imperial knowledge which is being used in subduing them. So this fear or uncertainty about the civilizational status, both of the colonizing nation and the nations or, or the people to be, to be colonized. And science and also writing are basically the, the civilizational me measuring rods. So yeah, these are basically my, um, were my interests in the essay. Um, I'm making reference to the discovery of a Dighton rock, which is an ins uh, a rock that was discovered on uh, on the East Coast uh, with uh, mysterious inscriptions. So there were all kinds of um, interpretations um, circulating in learned journals of the time in the 1830s and 40s, whether these might be inscriptions from Native Americans or from Norse or from even older um, settlers, European settlers, of course. Um, and I'm uh, working a little bit on commenting on the concurrency, you know, the temporal synchronicity between uh, the writing of Arthur Gordon Pym and these, um, the discovery of this inscription, this unreadable, this unreadable writing, which is something that uh, obsessed American archaeologists as well, like people who, uh, like uh, John Lloyd Stevens, for example, or Frederick Catherwood, you know, who, who discovered, as they say, of course, they didn't discover any Maya ruins, but they, so that's how they presented it, but they couldn't read the Maya writing on the stales on uh, on those ruins or um, architectural uh, edifices. Um, there is also a current uh, issue or a current discussion, a, a series of current events, uh, which I'm also making reference to, which is providing somewhat of the political framework for my essay. And that's, uh, that's all these discussions, which we have here in Germany and Europe, but also in the United States. Uh, which can be grouped under the under the item or the term um, population replacement. So this constant fear that uh, pure white women are having sex with non altogether pure white men, producing a race of mongrels, or uh, polluting the yeah the gene material basically of the white race. And this is an issue. Okay, so this is a contemporary terminology now, I guess. It's also caricature of contemporary terminology. But, uh, but the issue, of course, of the production of, of uh, racial hybridity is something that can be traced back to the 19th century. And this was a big discussion in the 19th century uh, with reference to African slavery in particular. Um, and I'm trying to somewhat suggest a, a, a con continuity of an ideological continuity between the constructions of hybridity and the discussion on racial hybridity in the 19th century and our current uh, yeah, far right-wing discussions about population replacement, white genocide. So this is not white people committing genocide. Of course, the term refers to the white race being the subject or the victim of genocide. Um, so this whole co uh, contemporary ongoing um, uh, ideology and narrative of white supremacy by conducted by white supremacists, uh, something that uh, frames provides the frame for my for my essay. Yeah, so much for that. Thanks for listening to me. Right. Thank you, and I'll jump right in. Um, I want to start off like everybody else with a word of thanks to John Ernest for assembling this team, sort of like the scholarly Nick Fury 
and for his mentorship over the years. Um, it's humbling to be in a volume with people whose work continues to shape my own intellectual life. Um, thank you again to John, to Cambridge, and to everyone else who contributed. Um, Ernest begins the volume with a simple statement, quote, race is central to American history. It is or should be impossible to understand the United States without attending carefully to how race has been defined and deployed at every stage of the nation's history, end quote. Yet we are here today in a moment when John's caveat, or should be, bears a lot of pressure from bad faith challenges to the notion that race and white supremacy were key elements of the nation's founding to efforts to ban books and fields of study that speak to this presence. Um, my essay in the volume started with two goals. The first was to trace how African-American writers develop literary history as a way to counter, as a way to account for and challenge white supremacy. This project took me to Phyllis Wheatley, whose poems on various subjects begins with a literary history. Wheatley at once places Terence, the African poet, in a canon of foundational literature, and at the same time questions the notion that there can be only one African at a time, or that one is sufficient for representation. One text by Douglas, one author of color in a collection or on the panel, one member on the board, I could go on. It's an institutional problem I suspect many in this gathering constantly face. The second and concomitant goal was to think through Henry Howland Garnett's contention in 1865 that literature and hum humor would be a marker for progress. We'll know we've made it, Garnett argues, when the arts and humor no longer find sustenance from the struggles of their press. It's a fascinating argument to revisit in a moment when prominent comedians seem offended that we don't care for anti-trans humor and when cancel has been adopted as a trope for white grievance politics. For Garnett, this kind of representation wouldn't disappear through an edict, but rather because the democracy would have become so strong that people would no longer have a taste for that kind of work. Um, we're clearly a long way off from that moment, but I like to linger with the way that Garnett poses literature as both a marker of public taste, but also as a framer of public taste. As I read the page proofs from the volume and John's introductory notes for the sections, I found myself returning to a few key words. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. The first, process or messy process. As John Grammer notes in this essay, what race would become on the other side of reconstruction did not seem inevitable, even in the 1890s. The essays in the reconfiguration section in particular speak to processes and the messes literature simultaneously clarifies and complicates. I'm also struck by the way the images in the volume tell a story about multiple processes of racialization and representation happening simultaneously and often at cross purposes from Cutter and Wallace's essays in the Envisioning Race section to Nishikawa's collection of paperback covers and Wong's collection of prints. Also shout out to Cambridge UP for allowing the volume to have so many images. The images are great. Um, the messiness also cautions against applying the same methods and definitions of race indiscriminately across groups. This is often especially true in a field that has often clung to a black white binary. And so across multiple essays in the volume and throughout John's framing device in the volume, we see essays pushing against and exploding the tendency to go back to this binary. Alongside a process with its implication of change over time, contingency and the potential for something different, the volume gave me a profound sense of repetition, but a repetition that cannot be reduced to sameness. This is the always already of settler logic outlined in Vigil's essay. Ernest often frames this phenomenon as fractal in nature. Race is the mental brought set of the United States. Childs, Katie Childs' essay toggles between the synchronic and the diachronic and Foreman's attention to the poetry cycle will also stick with me on this front. So throughout the volume, we have these essays attending to a kind of the, the repetition of tropes, but also the way this repetition adapts and changes over time. My own work tries to register the simultaneity of process and repetition through the figure of seriality. The serial both constant, is both constant and changing, iterative and singular. 
understanding race like singularity requires a capacity to do the both and, to live in and with the and also. Finally, the volume left me with the simultaneous sense of abundance and insufficiency, both the celebration of what has been done and an affirmation of the ongoing need for recovery and more work. On the one hand, this volume sits at just over 450 pages. It's gonna be a chunk on the shelf. On the other hand, it does not and cannot claim to be comprehensive. On the one hand, contributors speak to long and vibrant literary traditions, Native American, Latinx, African American, Asian American, Euro American, and so on. And yet, as Gabrielle Foreman and Caritha Mitchell and others note, we're still wading through discourses of lack and insufficiency to find the work and to find suitable methods for talking about the work. And we're constantly working against received narratives that attempt to reduce traditions to single concepts like protest. Right? Other keywords that emerged as I read the page proofs for the volume, um, community, story, justice, repair, taste, future, mediation, space and geography, and temporality. On the last one, I, I wonder, and I wondered this as I read um, John's introduction to the final section in particular, how this volume might have looked if we were writing the essays now, sort of post 2020. Um, and at the same time, I read them and I found myself thinking, huh, I wish the contributors hadn't been quite so accurate, um, which is to say that this volume will be both timely and timeless in the sense that the structures it articulates are structures that we will continue to be working through, you know, pressing forward and timeless in the sense that I don't think any of the sort of truths and stories that the volume outlines will change just because any given administration changes. So thanks. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, my remarks are much briefer. I will start by saying Pidame Ayapi, which is Dakota, thank you all for your contributions to the volume, of course, for me this morning, though I think it's this evening for others. So I'm coming to you from Western Massachusetts and the Nanatuck homelands and the Quinnitequa Valley. So I just want to acknowledge the Indigenous nations who have both historically and today had ties to this region and continue to uh, have enduring relations in the land that is where I, where I live and work. So my chapter uh, has some keywords as well. I, I'm really thankful to hear Derek Spire's rumination on the various keywords in the volume. So my keywords are race, settler colonialism, nation, blood quantum, assimilation, citizenship, and native. And in my chapter, Native Reconfigurations, I begin with a quote from 1916 by noted Seneca ethnologist and social activist, Arthur C. Parker. So I'm gonna share that now. And he writes, the status of the immigrant who came to America because he willed to do so and had an end in view, the status of the slave who was forced to come and the status of the American native who was here in their original form all differ. It is one thing to say I came because I desired to rule. Another thing to say I came because I was compelled to serve and quite another thing to say I was here and this continent was mine. Unpacking Parker's comments is where my chapter begins in order to point to the interconnectedness of policies created by the US nation during the turn of the 20th century as they related to immigration and assimilation. Furthermore, I consider literature and American literary history more broadly as indigenous writers use their texts and narratives concerning Americanness to examine the fraught interplay between the institution of slavery and settler colonialism in relation to the one drop rule and the logic of blood quantum. These foundational notions of race and belonging, my essay contends, helped maintain white supremacy and more specifically for indigenous writers, the canonization of American literary forms became a new terrain upon which they might stake claims to the US nation, both as a means of resisting erasure when they produce counter narratives to the logic of elimination of the native as theorized by Patrick Wolf and others, and by representing their own voices, stories, and identities in ways that contested the very terms by which race, nation, and belonging were being imagined and defined. I'm very excited to be part of this panel today and the larger conversation we're going to have to launch this volume because I believe this text offers new ideas for scholars concerning their research and teaching. And as a historian and literary critic, 
and Native American Indigenous Studies scholar, I'm especially enthusiastic about the many contributions within this book that amplify Indigenous perspectives alongside those of other groups who have not necessarily been at the center or forefront of how we think about American literature and culture. So I feel like what I'm really most interested in going forward in, the, in this webinar is how do we make sense of the various constructions of race, nation, and belonging when there are so many um, groups who are expressing their ideas, their experiences through literature and through cultural forms. So I'm, like I said, I'm gonna keep it short and I'm excited to pass it to Ed Lee and we'll get to talk about many things. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to join everyone in offering thanks to John for organizing this um, volume and also for bringing us together in this forum to have this conversation. Um, and I'm going to begin with what Derek brought up, which is this question of temporality. Um, and when I first started working on this essay contribution, it was 2018. Um, and it was two flashpoints um, around which my kind of um, the idea for this essay was constellated. Um, the first of which was the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. And also the rise of the zero tolerance immigration enforcement policy under the Trump administration. So when I turn to the essay, the essay itself is actually organized around issues and writings related to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. And as many of us know, it was a watershed moment in American history as the first racially specific federal immigration restriction targeting one specific nationality of immigrants to the US. Um, we also, many of us know that it was preceded by the 1875 Cage Act which had laid the groundwork for the Chinese Exclusion Act by effectively prohibiting the immigration of Chinese women as quote unquote immoral and effectively undesirable immigrants to the US. And we can consider it, this as a kind of more of a soft policy biopolitical approach to restricting Chinese immigration by preventing the establishment of immigrant family formations on the US, uh, on US soil and really ensuring that we have a population of temporary male sojourners in the country. So the essay itself is really interested in exfoliating the kind of two-pronged nature of the actual Chinese Exclusion Act from 1882. Um, the first of which it restricted the immigration of Chinese laborers while exempting the wealthier and more elite so-called Chinese merchant class. What it did was establish an economic class-based entry model that led to the construction of what we now familiarly refer to as the quote unquote legal versus illegal immigrant paradigm. Um, so for example, the uh, Scott Act, which was a um, kind of enforcement or, or, or kind of a, um, um, ex like a aggravation of the Chinese Exclusion Act, expanding the original retroactively canceled identity certificates that had once permitted Chinese legal residents in the US to travel abroad and return. And when it did so, it stranded abruptly roughly 20 to 30,000 Chinese legal residents outside of the US who were either traveling for work or visiting family and instantaneously transformed them into improperly documented or what we now call undocumented immigrants because their paperwork was no longer valid. Um, the second aspect of the Chinese Exclusion Act that I wanted to kind of kind of unveil a bit more was um, a thing that we don't talk about as much, which is the act explicitly prohibited all Chinese from naturalizing to US citizenship. And in so doing, it offered an early interpretation of the racialized language of the earliest US Naturalization Act, the language of any free white alien, male or female, can naturalize. And this language of whiteness is extended even into the 1870 amendment, which extended naturalization rights to those of aliens of African nativity and persons of African descent. So it's an early instance where we have kind of um, a definition of whiteness underway within the law. And this predates the kind of racial prerequisite laws that Ian Haley Lopez discusses in White Before Law, which comes with the Ozawa and the Thin cases in the early 20th century. 
so in laying this groundwork, I then turned to the literature and really complex and really contradictory ways um, to the earliest Chinese North American writers in their journalism, short fiction, and also in their life, really kind of work through the kind of two-pronged nature of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I look at Wang Chin Fu and Edith Maud Eaton, whom some of you may know better as Si Sin Far, her pen name. And I look at how they took advantage of just the heterogeneity of the periodical format and all its kind of, you know, um, you know, wide ranging possibilities, how they engaged with the kind of real dual nature of Chinese exclusion. Um, you may know Wang less um, in many ways because his writings was really delimited by the ephemerality of newspaper pen, no, newspaper, newsprint, excuse me. Um, later on in life, he became an informant for immigration officials. He had a brief appointment as a Chinese inspector in New York. And over time, he limited his political advocacy to citizenship and the nation state. He's known for establishing one of the earliest Chinese English newspapers in New York. He also established the Chinese Equal Rights League. And over time, he shifted his politics from crusading against Chinese exclusion to advocating for citizenship and naturalization rights for Chinese legal immigrants, legal residents, highlighting in many ways the US as a nations of, you know, nations of immigrants ideal. He began to kind of vilify the undocumented or the quote unquote illegal Chinese immigrant. In contrast, Edith Maud Eaton, as um, Mary Chapman's kind of biographical research has uncovered, really witnessed and possibly participated in her family's activities to smuggle undocumented Chinese across the Canadian border into the US. Her father was twice arrested for smuggling immigrants across the border. And in many ways, her writing really refracts the kind of complex relationship she had to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And we see this in her tendency to blur distinctions between, between so-called legal and illegal elite, non-elite migrants. Her writings really began to espouse over time a more kind of capacious human rights-based approach to transnational migration. And I really see her writings as trying to seek out an alternative to territorialized citizenship, which is what Wang Chin Fu, on the opposite hand, began to kind of embrace over the course of his life and writings. Um, she too used humor to kind of subvert xenophobia and nativist discourses that fixated on undocumented Chinese immigrants as national security threats. Her smugglers, undocumented migrants, really start to embrace a really different sense of territoriality and show the border as a kind of social fiction. And I see these lesser studied tales and writings of Eaton's as supplementing the ones that we're more familiar with, which are the merchant family tales, many of them kind of sentimental tales of legal migration. So really at the end of the essay, the takeaway and kind of thinking about Wong and Eaton in relation is that you see the enforcement of Chinese exclusion exacerbating disparities between elite and non-elite migrants, highlighting, really emphasizing class tensions and, and, and just discord within migrant communities, giving rise to perhaps what we are familiar with now as the paradigm of the good versus bad immigrant, the good versus bad Asian. Um, and as significantly, it shows how public anxieties over undocumented Chinese in the language of the time was quote unquote contraband Chinese. How it really transformed the US immigration system into a racializing technology of national fortification. And we see this now today as our contemporary immigration policies continue to use securitization as justification for heightened border controls turning immigration issues into a problem of quote unquote law and order with little thought to the question of human rights or fundamental rights considerations. And you see this refracted in the writings of Wang Chin Fu and Edith Maud Eaton, the kind of complexity of this discourse and really how that figure of the criminalized quote unquote illegal immigrant becomes a ready foil for the American citizen. And you see this in the stark contrast in how Wong and Eaton approach this question of exclusion over the course of their life and writings. 
And so I'll leave it at that and we still have time for some Q&A. Uh, thank you, everyone. Wow. Um, I edited this volume and now I'm even looking forward to reading it. So that, uh, this is wonderful. Um, we do have some time for Q&A. We have one question in Q&A. I'd like to note as well that we also have some other contributors in attendance. Um, Edward Larkin and Katie Childs wrote the first two essays for the volume and Gabrielle Foreman wrote one of the closing essays for the volume, uh, the Reflections and Prospects section, which I think of as sort of the mission statement um, part of the, the volume, although I think there are mission statements um, all through the volume. But um, um, it would be wonderful to hear from the other contributors as well. Um, and as I note, we do have a question um, from uh, Greg Lasky, which I'll read. This volume uh, looks so wonderful. Um, and um, he notes, I've only had the chance to read John's introduction. I was struck by John's point in that introduction about how easy it is, has been, to divert our attention from thinking about the ugly white supremacy that marks American culture versus the more triumphant accounts penned by writers of color. Would John or the panel speak a bit about what it means to study race in American literature from that vantage point? Um, I wonder whether anyone would care to um, address that. How easy it is or has been to divert our attention from thinking about the ugly white supremacy that marks American literature versus the more triumphant accounts penned by writers of color. Well, I, I can jump in. If That'd it's be all great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking a lot, uh, at least, uh, along about what you were saying. I mean, that this, that this question raises how to talk about literature and its contributions to shaping American culture with contradiction and complexity in mind, right? That because these authors experience the world and therefore then brings that, those experiences and those lenses to their representations on the page in ways that are always you know, fluid, negotiating it is a kind of protein moment, you know, that they're, they're you know, able to demonstrate how unstable race actually is, right? And, and how unstable the project of the US nation is, right? And, and to me, that's where you see those fractures and fissures in the foundations that, you know, um, can't be upheld, right? When it comes to white supremacy, when you have other folks coming in and saying, well, this is my story, my perspective, my narrative, right? And it doesn't map off to, to that sort of foundation, right? It's not going to be upheld by that. And I think there's plenty of, of white writers who do that as well, right? Um, for various reasons, depending on where we are in time and space. So that's how I would approach responding to that. Good, good. Um, when I, and I, I, I meant to note too that um, also joining us today is Min Song, who also wrote for the last um, um, section of the volume. So um, it would be uh, lovely to hear from um, Katie, Gabrielle, or Min, if you um, care to say anything. But don't feel pressured. <laughs> Man. Thanks, John. I, I really appreciate uh, all the work you've done in editing this volume, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the whole thing. It's just uh, going to be a phenomenal uh, piece, uh, and just the ambition of, of trying to think about all of these topics together in one big volume and, and putting them into conversation. It just seems to me really important right now for us to engage in this kind of collective labor to first feel that we aren't alone in our little silos concerned about our little issues, uh, but that we're part of a much bigger story. Uh, and, and a story that continues. I mean, the challenge for us is that it is not a historical work, but, uh, but that we're immersed right in the middle of the very topic that we're talking about. And, uh, and, and it's hard not to feel personally 
you know, that, that we're also in a period of extraordinary backlash, not only in the US, but internationally around these issues. Uh, and, and in some places, I think the kind of intellectual work we're doing good faith intellectual work we're doing based on uh, the best available evidence uh, of which we are constantly trying to improve the quality of, that this kind of work is, is being criminalized uh, and that, it, that it, it will become dangerous to do this kind of work, uh, which to me suggests the importance of doing it and, um, and participating in this kind of project. So I, I wanna thank you, John, for, for continuing uh, I think this really important labor and bringing all of us together to engage in this kind of conversation. If I could just jump in, it would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Min's heroic work for the presses list in Asian American literature as co-editor of the Cambridge History of Asian American Literature and also the multi-volume uh, Asian American Literature in Transition. So. I just draw your attention to those projects, which are extraordinarily ambitious and pertinent to, alongside Ranjini Singh. Can I jump in with a, just a quick comment to Greg's question? Um, I think it's important that we not assume that all minority voices will voice a triumphant narrative or account mm. against white supremacy. And I, I think it's important to know, like in particular with my essay contribution, I wanted the heterogeneity of Asian North American responses to something like the Chinese Exclusion Act. And, and I think this has a lot to, to say in how we select the writers and texts that we include in our syllabus that they not necessarily voice one kind of univocal political position. And I find this really difficult to teach sometimes because the students sometimes have a hard time assimilating uh, political opinions of Wang Chinfu. I mean, he does come to vilify undocumented Chinese immigrants. And how do we kind of assimilate that in a way that you know, is productive and useful for conversation because it seems so antagonistic and problematic in terms of, you know, a, a more progressive, let's say, for lack of a better word, viewpoint on that particular issue. So just to kind of, um, you know, echo what Kiara had mentioned, right? The kind of complexity, the messiness, I think is a word that John used in his introduction. I mean, I think that's really important to emphasize the heterogeneity of minority responses to any given kind of issue, be it kind of the Chinese Exclusion Act in my paper, but all of these other kind of white supremacist kind of structured, um, you know, uh, um, kind of just ways in which, you know, it has kind of structured American life in these complex ways and given rise to competing and different visions of what race means. The response itself is heterogeneous and complex and messy at times. Lee, um, thank, thank you for that. Um, oh, if Gabrielle, please go, go ahead. I wanted to jump in and just um, say a little more about both messiness and um, networks of intellectual generosity and temporality. Um, you know, one of the things about um, seeing these uh, heterogeneous histories that make up um, what we call a nation that is embedded in the world um, and embedded in the Atlantic, embedded in so many systems of exchange is that um, both setbacks and um, advances um, happen on different temporal moments and moments of erasure and dismemory um, that we don't know a lot about because of the colonial networks that bring us back to whiteness so often as um, the conversation in relation to any of our various heterogeneous communities. And I mean that intra, intra community heterogeneity is almost always um, embedded in a, in a context of, um, of um, white historical temporal arcs. Um, this book really uh, disrupts that, um, is part of a history of exchange, which points out to um, each of us how much we don't know um, about each other, um, and therefore about the struggle in the current moment 
about what informs it, about what allows us to um, uh, resist, what allows us to do so in ways that structure accountability and knowledge production and knowledge preservation and justice preservation and advancement. And I think that that also reflects the um, ethos, um, the model, the inspiration that's provided by its editor, um, by John Ernest, um, who I think um, is um, having the people in this volume, I looked at the people in this volume and went, this is about a circuit of relationships, of investments, of accountability, of respect, of generosity in relationship to knowledge production that only somebody like John could pull off, mm -hmm. right? Like we said yes to this volume at, you know, which is a big 450 page volume where essays frankly get lost, right? You know, because of our trust and our experience with the editor who has invested in so many of our careers and the careers of our students and the careers and the ethos without ever wanting anything back, except to build the field, except for a politics of generosity that links us together in networks of intellectual production, which call for generosity and accountability. And so John, I just wanna acknowledge the modesty with which you do this work, the generosity with which you do this work, the seriousness with which you do this work, the community building you model when you do this work, all with um, expectations only of elevating other people um, and elevating the work. And, um, and, and that is what allows um, so many of us to come together in this volume, um, which raises such important questions for all of us. Um, and just to close by, by really acknowledging and seeing and making visible what is often that invisible labor. Thank you again from all of us. Well, Gabrielle, as always, you were far too generous and I, but I do appreciate it. And I'm deeply moved um, by it and deeply grateful to be a part of this project. Uh, I know that our time is uh, over, but I'll just end by saying, you know, you've all noted that I like the word messiness and I, and I do. And I made that the organizing principle actually of this volume. The challenge of reading this volume is that it's not a volume designed to make it easy for the reader. Um, you are entering into conversations that have been going on um, and it does not set you up for the conversations. It does not present a neat little narrative. It actually confronts us all uh, with what we don't know, what we need to know, the people we need to be working with, um, the communities we need to develop, uh, the knowledge we need to have that we can only have through collaborative uh, labor. So um, it's, it's intended to be a challenging volume. I don't think it does anybody any favors to turn the story of race in the United States into a neat little tale that can be told from the beginning to the end with a neat narrative arc. It just isn't, doesn't work that way. And the more we can embrace the messiness of it, the complexity of it, the better off um, we will be and the more prepared we will be uh, for the challenges that we are facing now and the challenges that we will certainly be facing ahead. So thank you everyone for, um, for bringing so much to this volume and so much to this event. I, I couldn't be more grateful. Ray, do you have any closing words? I, I do. Th thanks to all the contributors for a, such a richly informed detail and exhilarating conversation. To adapt, John, I, I, uh, I'm the publisher and even I am looking forward to reading the book after um, this uh, event. Um, and thanks to Gabriel for that wonderfully eloquent uh, tribute to John and everything he's done for it. I can't improve on that. The book is available in the UK in the middle of June. 
It will be available in August in the US. The global supply chain problems that you're all reading about, you know, are responsible for the delay. It's priced for individual purchase, so very affordable. We hope you enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed uh, this uh, broadcast. We'll, we'll make it available. If you've got any questions, please contact me or, or Emma. But thank you to John and his wonderful team of contributors and to everybody listening for making the event possible. Thank you.